Welcome to worship today. I'm Kip Rosen, one of the pastors here at Asbury. Today we're concluding our Upgrade to 5G series. We're looking at five G words that are attitudes and attributes we hope to cultivate in our lives that help us to more faithfully walk with Jesus. We've talked about gumption, generosity, gratitude, and grace. We define gumption as a deep commitment to God that's lived out by putting our faith into action. We talked about generosity and how it comes in different forms as we give our time, talent, our resources, our attention and affection. We talked about how gratitude shapes our lives as we respond to God's goodness in our lives, no matter what our situation might be. And last week, Pastor Matt helped us to reflect on grace, that free, unearned, unmerited love and forgiveness God offers. Today, glory. What comes to mind when you think of fame and glory? Do you think of the recent Super Bowl victory? Well-known politicians, movie stars, or popular singers, do they come to mind? Maybe you think of your favorite basketball team winning a championship. Or maybe you think of your own brush with fame and glory. One of my few opportunities for glory was in intramural basketball in college. Boy, that was big time, right? It was the end of the season and the tournament was going on and our team was one win away from playing in the championship game. The game came down to the last few seconds and we were behind by two points. We have the ball. There's no three point shot at that time so our only hope is to tie the game and go into overtime. Well I had the ball and I took a shot from the top of the key and the shot went in. It tied the game. Plus I was fouled on the shot, so with a second left on the clock, I went to the free throw line to win the game. If I make the basket, we are on to the championship game. If I miss, we go into overtime. So I'm at the line, three dribbles, set, follow through, the ball goes in and out, I miss the shot and I missed my chance for intramural glory. As somebody quipped, glory may be fleeting, but obscurity is forever. Well, we did, however, go on in the overtime to win the game, and the following week won the championship. Well, how would you like to have some fame and glory? I don't think we have to apologize for desiring glory and fame because it's something that might motivate us to accomplish things in life we, we would never have done otherwise. And I can't help you today with the fame part, but I can tell you this. You and I are supposed to have glory. Listen to the words of Jesus. He's praying for the church in John chapter 17. Listen to the uh, first part of the prayer. He says, the glory that you have given me I've given them. He's praying to God. Jesus is referring to his followers and says, I have given them the glory that you've given me, God. Well, do you have yours? You're a follower of Christ. Do you have the glory? Now, obviously, the glory Jesus is referring to is different than the, what the world calls glory. Most of us will never know the world's glory. We probably will never be featured on I don't know what the modern equivalent of lifestyles of the rich and famous is, but what the world calls glory is not what Jesus means by glory. So what does it mean? The word glory is found over 600 times in the Bible, in our English Bible, and it's an important word, but a challenging word to define. The Greek word for glory means bright or shiny, splendor, radiance, magnificent, great, fame, honor, prestige. That's the Greek word. The main Hebrew word for glory means heaviness, a weight to it. Isn't that interesting? Glory means a weight or heaviness. I'll come back to that in a second. In general, we can say three things about glory. One, glory in the Bible generally has to do with light. It is shining, often striking light. Two, glory is heavy. It has something, it's something that has weight. And three, glory is visible. It's something we can see. It's meant to be seen. So we might say that the glory, glory is the visible presence of God displayed in dazzling magnificence. Glory is God's character, God's attributes expressed and visible. Glory is God's 
wait. One commentator summarized glory this way. The glory of God refers first and foremost to the sheer weight of the reality of God's presence. Here's an abbreviated definition of glory. God's visible, weighty presence. Well, what does it mean to be weighty, that heavy presence? Well, you might remember in Bible times, in Bible lands, there were essentially desert conditions. Winds were constantly blowing the sand and changing the contour of the landscape. But a rock does not shift in the storm. A rock is heavy, it has weight, a weighty presence. In the shifting sands of our lives, God is our rock, God is heavy, God does not move. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, Paul connects glory and weight. It says, for this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Glory is God's visible, weighty presence. Now, most of the time, glory is ascribed only to God. And you can probably come up with all sorts of verses about glory. There's some powerful song, psalms about God's glory. Psalm 8, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Your glory is chanted among the heavens by mouth of babes and infants. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Or Psalm 24, lift up your heads, O you gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Most of the time when we read the Bible, hear about glory, it's, re it's referring to God. Now, a few years ago, there was a survey conducted among middle school students in youth groups across the United States, and they asked these young people, describe the God you believe in. These middle school kids said things like, God will always be there even when you don't think, even you, when you don't think so. God's not a man or a woman. God is a spirit, a light that is everlasting. Strong, powerful, loving, caring, forgiving, mysterious. Someone said, God loves us no matter what we do, the one true God. Somebody else said, awesome, God is a 100% guarantee of a problem-free life. Well, wouldn't we wish that to be true? Others said things like, I believe in the God that sent his only son Jesus to die on the cross. God loves all people, even me. Kind, just, merciful, stern. Somebody else said, fun, has a sense of humor. God wants us to obey him. Those young people have a pretty good grasp on who God is. Certainly, God is all those things and more. And all of those are part of God's visible, weighty presence, God's glory. And Jesus, of course, shared God's glory. In the opening of John's Gospel, we read, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. You might remember the wedding that, where Jesus turned the, uh, the water into wine. John wrote, Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Glory is ascribed to God, and glory is, ascri is ascribed to Christ. Jesus is God's visible, weighty presence. Can we have glory? Can we be God's visible presence? weighty presence in the world. We know God dwells in the heavens, so they shine with God's glory. We're told God dwelt in the temple, and so the temple shines with God's glory. The psalmist sings, I love the house where you live, O Lord, the place where your glory dwells. The truth is that any place God dwells, there is glory. And if God dwells within us, then our lives will shine with God's glory. St. Paul writes, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? 1 Corinthians 6, 19. When the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives, our, our bodies house the living God. And if God dwells in our lives, then we have the glory. We become God's visible, weighty presence. But here's the mistake we make. We often think that glory comes from something we do. That glory is something we accomplish. Make a free throw, 
glory. Well, that might be true in terms of what the world calls glory, but what God calls glory is simply opening ourselves to God's presence in our lives. Gl glory is not something we accomplish, it's a, it's a gift. And Jesus prayed, God, the glory that you've given me, I've given them. Christ gave us glory. We're God's visible, weighty presence. Now, we might not always display that gift. The gift of God's presence might not always seem clearly visible in us. Our light shining for God might seem dim sometimes, but we have been given the gift of God's visible, weighty presence. Do we allow people to see it in us? Centuries before Jesus prayed that prayer, the psalmist marveled about God creating humans and giving them the gift of glory and honor. Remember these verses? When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have established, what are human beings that you're mindful of them and mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them little less than God and crowned them with glory and honor. The psalmist says we were created little less than God, crowned with glory, glory. I think of the story of creation in Genesis. We're made in the image of God. When, when God made the duck, God said, that's good. When God made the elephant, God chuckled and said, well, that's good. When God made the maple tree and other plants, God said, that's good. And likewise with the squirrel and quail and turkeys and everything else, that's good. But it wasn't enough. And finally God said, I'm gonna make something like myself, my very image. I'm gonna make something that when people look at it, they're gonna say, God. And that's when God made you. That great preacher Fred Craddock said that we are hesitant to claim that identity made in God's image, reflecting God's glory. We're hesitant to claim and live God's image. We don't allow people to see it in us. We'd rather say, we're only human. Fred says, I'm sick of that. He gives this example, he says, a shortstop catches a ball without mistake 300 times. Finally, he drops it and somebody says, it's only human. Well, what was he when he made the plays? She bakes a cake eight inches tall. It's just beautiful. Then the church is going to have a fellowship dinner, and so she went make, wants to make one to outdo herself. And so she bakes a cake, and it looks like the sole of a shoe. She says, well, I'm only human. Well, what was she when the cake was eight inches tall? When the singer climbs the silver stairs and leaves every note as clear as the morning dew, what do people say? That's wonderful. If her voice cracks, well, she's only human. Why? why? Why do we say we're human when we make a mistake? Weren't you made in the image of God? So Craddock says, don't ever say, do not ever say, I'm only human. When somebody says, that was beautiful, you say, well, after all, I'm human. When somebody says, best I've ever eaten, you say, after all, I'm human. When somebody says, that was a beautiful prayer today, you say, well, after all, I'm human. Would you do that? I, I know sometimes we don't act like it. We don't live the glory. We don't bear the image of God well. You take that psalm, you have made us little less than God, and you hold it up beside the daily news. It doesn't always seem to fit. Left a baby in a trash can. Hit the pedestrian, didn't even stop. Troops and tanks push into a country. Airstrikes hit the cities. They don't seem to fit. I know, I know they don't. But every once in a while, every once in a while, Craddock tells when he was a minister in the, uh, in the mountains of East Tennessee, that the church would have a vacation Bible school every summer. And he had these kids, maybe they were third and fourth graders, and uh, the, the vacation Bible school would last two weeks. And at the end of the day one, he said, like he was ready to quit. But 
Uh, he was dealing with 12 kids all day for two weeks, and the lesson that year, he said, was on nature. Well, he used up all that stuff on, on day one, and so he thought, well, what am I going to do for the rest of the time? But he thought of something. He, he would send them out into the woods, let them get something that reminded them of God, and then bring it back. So he rang a bell, and he said, now when I ring this bell, you go out into the woods, find something that reminds you of God, and when I ring the bell again, bring it back and tell us what it tells you about God. So he rang the bell and they scattered into the woods. He said his plan was to not ring the bell again, <laughs> but he did. He rang the bell and they came back and he said to her, uh, what do you have there? And she said, a flower. And he said, what, is the, what does a flower tell you about God? She said, God is beautiful. He thought, now oh, that's good. What do you have? A rock. What does that tell you? God is stout. He thought, hey, that's good, that's good. What do you have? Huckleberries, and what do they tell you? God is good. God feeds us, and God feeds the birds. Another good answer. Well, then here's Jimmy East, the meanest kid Fred ever saw. But Jimmy is always there. They don't want him to always be there all the time, but he's always there. And so Fred says, well, Jimmy, what do you have? And Jimmy's holding the hand of his sister from the kindergarten group. And Fred says, what did you bring, Jimmy? And Jimmy says, uh, my sister. And Fred says, well, what does that tell you about God? And Jimmy said, um, um, I don't know for sure. And Fred thought to himself, that's it. That's it. This mean little kid recognized there wasn't a thing in the forest that told him as much about God as his sister. That's it. I would say God's visible, weighty presence was right there. It's right here. Do we reflect God's glory, God's visible, weighty presence? Do we, could we live God's presence even in simple ways? The education of Little Tree tells a marvelous story about a Cherokee Indian boy raised by his grandparents. Poor as Job's turkey, didn't have a thing. And Little Tree knew his grandparents had nothing to give him for Christmas that year because they had no money, but he wanted to desperately, desperately wanted to give something to his grandmother. So he, he got some leather hide, sold a little pouch, a coin purse, I guess you, you'd say it was, and he didn't want to give it to her and hurt her feelings because she'd say, well, little tree, I didn't get you anything. So do you know what he did? Do you know this story? He, he took the little coin purse and he pushed it down into the bin of dried beans. They ate dried beans all winter, and so he took the gift and he hid it. He pushed it down, he said, into the beans about Christmas deep. And his grandmother reached into that bin every day, October, November, December, and then about the middle and toward the end of December, she said, little tree, little tree, look what I found. Come see what I found. And he ran over and he looked at it and he said, uh, what is it? And she said, it's a gift. It's a Christmas present, but I don't know, I don't know who. And little tree said, that's beautiful. A, a little less than God. I know, I know, uh, some of us act like garbage sometimes. But have you ever had this experience? You, you look outside on a winter day and you see the garbage can and stuff spilling out the top and you think, man, that looks terrible. It's just awful, it's awful. But during the night, it snows. And when you look out in the morning, the garbage can is covered in beautiful snow, a mound of glory to God. How does Paul put it? You are created in God's image. You are recreated in Christ Jesus. You are God's masterpiece. A little less than God, you have the glory. God's visible, weighty presence. Let's live it. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we thank you for sharing your glory with us 
sharing your presence, your loving presence with us. I pray that you might empower us to reflect your light and love in our lives and help us to visibly bear your image in our lives. In the name and spirit of Jesus, amen.